globally, a third of all the food we produce each year gets thrown away. Meanwhile, 800 million people go to bed hungry who could be fed in a quarter of the food that we waste in the Western world. Hello and welcome back to 40 Minute Mentor, your pocket-sized career mentor. Today's replay episode features an incredibly mission-driven founder who has since coming on the podcast back in series four, been referenced as a dream mentor multiple times from subsequent guests. We're talking about none other than Tessa Clark, co-founder and CEO of the sharing app Olio. Tessa has actually been on the podcast twice, first in series four, and then secondly in our Where Are They Now feature series, talking about the evolution of Olio. Today, we're throwing it back to her original episode, where we discussed her early career, the leadership lessons she learned from working with James Dyson, the origin story of Olio, and the importance of its environmental impact ever since. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy a super inspiring 40 minutes with Tessa Clark. Tessa, it's wonderful to meet you. Thank you so much for being a 40 Minute Mentor today. We always kick off this podcast with a 30 second overview of a CV. So I wondered if you could start with that. Gosh, yes. Uh, So I started very briefly uh, at Boston Consulting Group, spent three years there, then decided I wanted to do stuff rather than just advise and so moved over into industry. And then I had about 15 years working in retail, financial services, and also media, always in the digital space. And then five years ago, I pursued my entrepreneurial journey and founded Olio, which is the world's first neighbor to neighbor food sharing app. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And I was going to say that's really good. I think from the start, they initially, the first few guests, I think there was a little bit of leeway, but actually that was super succinct. So thank you for that. You know, I'm really excited to kind of dive into your career, but I wanted to start at the beginning because a lot of our 40 minute mental guests have started their career in consulting and, and you were at BCG. So I'd be interested to know what, what are the main skills you learned from your time in consulting and how have they helped you now that you're a startup founder, a very successful startup founder? Well, I wouldn't go that far. I'd say we're kind of on our journey um, as a startup founder, but we're still alive. So hurrah. So I do think you learn a number of really important skills through consulting. And so in no particular order, I think you really understand and are taught the power of logic. And so any communication that you make really has to be very, very logical. And I think that's just absolutely critical for anyone who wants to be effective in business is you've got to be a logical, clear and concise communicator. Mm. Uh, Linked to that, We also learned very early on how to tell stories using slides. So I had a sort of misspent early career in in PowerPoint. And one of the most powerful things that they taught us was to write a skeleton deck and to just write the headline of every single slide before you did any of the content on the slides and to narrate the story arc through the slide titles And that's really, really powerful, especially when you're doing something like fundraising and Mm. you realize that actually investors only spend an average between two and three minutes on your deck. Then being able to tell a really powerful story just through the slide titles is critical. The other thing I think you learn in consulting is that there's a two by two matrix for absolutely everything. (laughs) Once you sort of get that concept of a two by two, um, it's just a really handy reference point and way of sort of thinking about things and breaking down markets or problems and stuff like that. And then the final thing is Excel and data crunching and analytics. So no associate CV would be complete without many, many hours crunching away in Excel. And that's really, really important because actually you need to have a firm grasp of the numbers and the basics to succeed in business. And it then gives you a really good instinct for when someone is bringing numbers to you, it's amazing sort of how quickly you can find out where the issues or the problems are if you've had that upbringing in consulting. 
Fantastic. Yeah. And I think, I mean, we, JBM started focusing on consulting and recruitment and as the world changed, we moved into scale ups. And I think we've seen firsthand how many successful transitions you see from, from that industry to tech. And you've clearly done that. I think there'll also be people that listen to this podcast, whether they're recent graduates or, or, or maybe looking at to pivot their career that they may want to move into consulting. So what's your advice for anyone that's listening, that's thinking about that at the moment? And I've got to ask, if you had your time again, would you go back? to BCG or would you do something different? Well, they're two separate questions there. So I think for anybody who's thinking about going to consulting, if you don't know what you want to do, which was my situation, then going to consulting is a great starting point because you get very, very quick induction into lots of different industries, lots of different functions within an organization. And you're always tackling the most interesting problems because they're the problems that are keeping the CEO awake at night. So if you don't know what to do, I think it's a brilliant career and it's a great leaping point into many other things. It gives you a degree of pedigree, I guess, if you like, that can be very helpful further down the line. If I'd have my time again then, yes, I'd probably do what I did. But if I were to be starting over now, given everything I know about the world and the climate crisis and what is happening, then I would probably be wanting to kind of get involved and start trying to solve the enormous problems that are facing humanity right now, because we don't actually have that much time and we need pretty much everybody to get involved solving these problems. Absolutely. And I'm sure lots of people listening to this will want to work for companies like Olio. So we can't wait to get on to that. But looking a little bit at, at the earlier parts of your, your career, after after BCG, you, you joined EMAP and stepped into the world of publishing, which is, um, is I guess, a, a different step to consulting. So, so why did you choose that industry? And how did you find that tra- transition from consulting to industry? Something that sometimes candidates can, uh, can, can struggle with? Well, being very honest with you, I didn't choose the industry. It chose me, specifically someone that I'd been working with at BCG, moved over to EMAP and recruited me over to join him. And if I look back and reflect on my career, I actually think I was far too passive. I just responded to opportunities that other Mm. people put in front of me. I I took headhunter calls and I, yeah, reacted to what was presented to me, what I didn't do enough of was spend quality time by myself, really pushing myself to understand what interests me, what I'm passionate about, what's going to kind of make me want to get up in the morning. So I I kind of, it seemed like a great opportunity when it was presented to me. Publishing was fun, exciting and sexy. And I was keen to be doing something rather than advising. Plus this job offer came at the height of the dot-com boom version 1.0 and so it was a really really exciting time uh, when digital was just starting to upend whole industries and so to me it seemed like a great space to be in and so I moved over to EMAP but specifically within their digital arm. Fantastic and it seems like in your career you've you've managed to switch industries very successfully which historically isn't always that easy to do and so so you move from publishing you you joined dyson as as md of e-commerce so how did that role come about and and it would be great to understand a little bit more about what that entailed from a skill set perspective yeah so again that role sort of found me rather than i i sort it out and and you're absolutely correct i am someone who whenever i go into a role i want sort of 50 percent of me to be thinking I can do this. And 50% of myself going, oh my God, I have absolutely (laughs) no idea if I can possibly do this. I need to have that, that sort of fear because that's what interests me and excites me. And I think it's also, I have always been the sort of quote unquote off spec candidate. Uh, And I've been told that a number of times in recruiting processes, because often when people are recruiting, they want someone who's been there, done that for their direct competitor, and then they want you to come there and do exactly the same again. Uh, And I'd say 75% of recruiters recruit with that mindset. And given that I was never someone who wanted to go and do again what I'd already done, I was always going to be that that off-spec candidate. And so that did narrow down sort of the number of organizations that I could work for, because many organizations are extremely risk averse and they're not prepared to take that punt on someone who hasn't done that exact job before. So with the move to Dyson, I also relocated, which out of London, which at the time uh, felt like a massive move. But uh, from a personal perspective, 
uh, I moved to Bath and that resulted in me uh, meeting my husband after about a decade of being single in London. So it was a brilliant move. And my role there essentially was to take the organization on a journey. And I was responsible for all things digital at Dyson. So that included running an in-house digital team who designed and developed, I think at the time, their 100 websites. I was responsible for CRM, for social media, which back then was a completely nascent function. And I was also responsible for building from pretty much scratch the e-commerce business that took place in each of their markets. Fantastic. It's such a brilliant brand that we all know and love. Actually, we had a, we bought a new Dyson Hoover this week. Um, and I can imagine it must have been a really interesting time, as you said, at the beginning of kind of social media becoming a thing. And it's always been known as an innovative company. So it'd be good to understand a bit about what the, the highlights were for you during that period. And also what were the biggest challenges you had to overcome? Because there was that 50%, as you said, the fear factor probably of moving into a new industry. So what was that? What were the difficulties? So the things that were most fascinating about working with Dyson. So first of all, I get got to work very closely alongside James himself. So met with him sort of twice a week for four years. And so I saw firsthand how an owner operated organization uh, functions. And the key learnings that I got there was about building a brand actually, and what that really entails and looks like. And I can remember a lot of people in particularly marketing used to get terribly excited to join Dyson and to join a, that incredible brand, but they quite quickly actually got frustrated because they didn't realize that in order to make such a powerful brand, there are an enormous amount of constraints that exist around it. And they would often just push back at that and find it very frustrating. But then if they stuck in long enough, they then realized that actually constraints ironically do breed creativity. And so that was a real lesson about how to build a brand. I also learned just how important customer support is as an organization. So they, their customer support teams were regularly winning customer support organization uh, of the year. And it was something that they invested very heavily in. And it's something that we're sort of um, very much copying at Olio. But I think the biggest challenges at Dyson was that they quite rightly had a reputation for being incredibly innovative. But one of the mistakes that I think they made as do many um, startups, although much less so today, was they felt that if they wanted a tool, they needed to build it themselves. And so as Mm. a result, uh, by the time I joined Dyson, there were just a ton of in-house legacy systems there. Because they were engineers, they had built the finance system and the HR system and the payroll system and all these sorts of things that probably didn't make sense for them to be doing. And so I definitely have learned from that. And whenever our team might say, oh, we can just build that, I will always kind of stop and challenge and say, Mm. but that's not our core USP is there's probably someone else out there doing that better than us. So that was a really important lesson. Great. And you mentioned uh, James Dyson, who's who's obviously a brilliant entrepreneur. What was it like actually working with him? And in terms of your own leadership style and, and, and I guess going on to set up your own business, were there things you took from that experience of working alongside someone so successful? Well, I definitely can empathize with him a lot more now that I am a yeah. startup founder myself, because sometimes I would see decisions that were made or see things that he would do and I you know, would could find them frustrating. Yeah. But once you start up your own thing and you realize just how much it is your own baby, then you understand why any founder or many founders still want to stay really, 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 really closely involved and can sometimes struggle to delegate and to uh, hand over control to other people. So I, I sort of saw him dealing with that and us on the other side trying to deal with that as well. And it, it's not straightforward. It's it, it's challenging trying to kind of give the right amount of delegation to people, but then also not so much that an organization might go adrift and, and lose its sense of its DNA. That really resonates with me. I mean, I've founded the business for eight years. The first two were just me, coffee shop to coffee shop. And then recently we brought in a director and, and it's been a brilliant experience in many ways. Um, he's doing fantastically well, but there is that thing that is your baby and letting go of things that you've always done. And, you know, it's a really important step for a business, but it's also difficult. So I, I completely understand that. The other thing I um, I really learned there is that when you're building a business, it's really important to surround yourself with people who will challenge you and who will also appropriately manage you. 
because yeah. it is very easy to become perhaps a little bit too selfish if you're a founder and mm. to want to retain the right to change your mind at the 11th hour. And actually what you need is people who are managing you through the process and saying, actually, no, you need yeah. to make your input at this point in time. And then once you've made that input, you then need to hand it over. And so it's really, really important as you scale, not to surround yourself with a bunch of yes, men and women, um, but to actually surround yourself with people who are going to constructively challenge you. That's great advice for any startup founder listening to this. I think that's a, it's a, it's an area that I think a lot of founders go wrong with. And we've seen the, we've seen the effects of that with some hiring we've had to do relatively recently. So, um, that's, that's a really interesting point. I'd love to know a bit more about what inspired you to venture out on your own and, and hear about how the, how the business evolved. Was it always a plan to, to build a mission driven business? Well, um, so I studied social, you know, I'm a farmer's daughter originally. I studied social and political sciences at Cambridge for undergrad. So I've always had a really, really strong interest in nature, the environment and society and people. And my long term career plan had always been, you know, I'd always wanted to do something positive in the world. I was very, very clear about that. And I had assumed when I graduated from university that that meant that I would need to go work in charity. But I felt that the most effective thing for me to do would be to work in business first, get as much learning as possible from the business world, and then transition across into the charitable world and take all of that learnings from the business world to the charitable world. That was the sort of the game plan. What happened in practice was I pursued this career in the business world, but I found myself the last sort of five to eight years of that feeling increasingly dissatisfied and feeling like if I were to die tomorrow on my deathbed, I wouldn't be proud of what I'd achieved, even though I, in theory, had a pretty stellar CV. I didn't personally feel proud of what I had achieved. And I was, you know, kind of going off to these leadership events and would find myself sitting in the audience and feeling so inspired by the stories of these speakers on the stage who were telling us about these incredible sort of purpose-driven businesses that they had created. And I'd reflect on what I had done and I'd feel so uninspired. And I just reached a point where I was just sick and tired of being uninspired by myself. And I thought, I need to sort this out. I need to actually be an inspiration to myself. I need to be something that I can be proud of. And so I kind of started to get my head around the fact that I wanted to do something entrepreneurial, but I lacked the courage or conviction. And, and quite frankly, there were close to no role models that I could identify with in the space. And so I think that probably delayed me from having mm. the confidence to become an entrepreneur for a very long time. But the light bulb moment that triggered me to set up Olio was when I was actually moving back from living uh, in Switzerland back to the UK. And on moving day, the removal men said I had to throw away all of our uneaten food. And given I'm a farmer's daughter, given I had a misspent childhood working incredibly hard on the family farm, I know you know, just how sacrilegious it is to throw yeah. away perfectly good food. So I wasn't prepared to do that. So much the irritation of the packing men, I set out into the streets with this food, with my newborn baby and my toddler to try and find someone to give the food to. And to cut a long story short, I failed miserably. Thought about knocking on my neighbor's doors and realized I didn't have time for that. And it would be awkward and embarrassing. They might not want what I got. <laughs> so I ended up going back to the apartment. And when the packing men weren't looking, I smuggled the non-perishable food into the bottom of my boxes. And that was the moment when I just thought, this is crazy the lengths I've gone to, mm. to try and avoid throwing away food. I'm probably doing something criminal, but to me, putting perfectly good food in a bin seems even more criminal. Yeah. I'd worked in digital for 15 years. I knew there was an app for everything. And I could not believe that there wasn't an app where I could just advertise my food to my neighbors and they could request it and pop around and pick it up. So that was the light bulb moment for Olio. And then my co-founder, Sasha, and I, we researched the problem of food waste and what we discovered blew our brains so globally a third of all the food we produce each year gets thrown away meanwhile 800 million people go to bed hungry who could be fed in a quarter of the food that we waste in the western world and then as if all that weren't bad enough if it were to be a country food waste would be the third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions after the usa and china and then half of all that big problem that i've just uncovered actually takes place in the home so it's, yeah. you know, you and I chucking away our food instead of giving it away. And as we look to the future, we've got another 2.2 billion people joining the planet. In order to feed us all, we need to increase global food production by at least 50%. Today, we have no idea how we're going to achieve it. So as I'm sure you can imagine, I've kind of been on that horrific journey of learning yeah. sort of what are... It's what are sobering horrific, stuff, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, dystopian nightmare we actually live in. And so realize that 
I had to do something about it. This idea of a neighbor to neighbor food sharing app seemed to myself and Sasha like something that really could have legs. Wonderful. What a story. And it's clearly, it's grown significantly over the last five years. I guess it, it's it's never without challenge. I know that that from starting my own business and, and working with a number of um, founders. So so it'd be good to understand a little bit about kind of the journey in those first few years. What, what were some of the challenges you had to overcome in scaling the business and how did you tackle them? So, I mean, so many challenges and still every single day <laughs> brings a, a whole slew of challenges. But the some of the challenges in the early days, the first one was how do you grow with no budget? Yeah. And um, Olio was definitely always going to be a model that needs to kind of get to scale as quickly as possible. And our solution to that was our ambassador program. And so very early on, people reached out to us to say, I love what you're doing. Can I help? And so myself and Sasha, we did phone calls, probably the first 200 people who contacted us just to wow. almost co-create with them to figure out how they could help. And as a result mm. of that, we developed our ambassador program, which now is all kind of fully automated. Uh, and we have over 50,000 people who have reached wow. out to be part of our ambassador program. And as a result of those people, today, a quarter of all Olio sharing that's taking place each week is taking place outside of the UK, with our most active markets being Mexico and Singapore and New Zealand, Incredible. places like that. So real learning there around just harnessing, especially if you're a mission-based business, don't mm. sort of be afraid of other people. You know, with my Dyson hat on, actually, I can remember thinking, oh gosh, you know, what happens if these people kind of ruin our brand or do something yeah. we wouldn't want? And I just realized that's just a ridiculous way to think about it. Like 99% of the time, people will get it right. And occasionally yeah. they'll do something that I wouldn't like to see them do, but we'll sort of cross that bridge when we get to it. So um, that was a really important problem and solution. And then the other challenge that we had actually, which was almost a harder one to overcome, was the fact that our early adopters hated food waste, therefore they didn't generate any food waste. That's an interesting and, problem. Yeah. Yep. So, and then um, the businesses that we had hoped in the early days would use the Olio app were far too busy, you know, the cafes and bakeries and delis, far too busy running their day-to-day -day business to bother putting food uh, on yeah. the Olio app. And so a food sharing app, we know food as I'm sure you can imagine, is not a particularly uh, successful proposition. So how we solved that problem was we said, well, why don't we take the early adopters who hate food waste but don't have any and match them up with the businesses who have loads of food waste but no time. And we developed our Food Waste Heroes program. And so today we now have over 10,000 trained volunteers who are matched up to their local businesses. And those volunteers on a allotted day and time will collect the unsold food from that business, take it home, add it to the app, and redistribute it to their local community. And that then has enabled us to kind of kickstart. So we've realized we're building a two-sided marketplace. For us, supply is always king. Supply is our constraint. Mm. And so the Food Waste Heroes program allows us to inject supply into our two-sided marketplace um, right across the country. And so Fantastic. that has worked so really well for us in those early days to deal with that challenge around our early adopters just being quite a different profile to what a mainstream audience is. Amazing. I absolutely love that. And uh, I think in this time, more than ever, where, where so many people during this climate are struggling for food and food banks kind of being overrun. And it's so great to hear that in action and happening and so many willing participants. And I also, I, I love that piece around the ambassadors. Um, JBMs actually has an ambassador program that we set up a couple of years ago. And um, I think it's that sense of community, bringing people on that journey and, you know, people that are driven by the same sort of mission. It's such a powerful tool and you know all the social media stuff's great and all the marketing's great but nothing beats the power of word of mouth in my opinion so i think that's completely, fantastic completely completely agree with you community is at the heart of everything that we do and what we've realized is that whilst in this day and age we are theoretically more connected than we've ever been we're actually lonelier mm. than we've ever been so there are nine million people in the uk who say that they are always or often lonely and what Olio is doing is, is sort of directly tackling that by connecting people with their local community. And that's what gives it all meaning and purpose and joy. And that's what makes our community so passionate about, about what they're doing. That's amazing. That's amazing. So anyone listening to this, sign up, get out there and, 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 and get involved. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, fundraising, which is something that anyone listening to this that's, that's building a startup will be you know, having to tackle that uh, particular challenge, but it is a, an essential part of growing a, a startup. So, and, and you've been able to you know, raise, I think, 
10 million dollars in terms of funding but actually frustratingly a, a small relatively small amount uh, of vc money goes to female entrepreneurs so i just wanted to touch upon dni in this space in the vc space and, and get your take on you know is enough being done and what can be done differently to to level that playing field so in a word is enough being done no just sharing a little bit of data in the uk 1% of all venture capital goes to female founded businesses, 89% goes to male founded businesses, and the delta goes to mixed teams. And the reason why that is just so problematic is because in my experience, what I have seen is that it's often the diverse founders, and by the way, that's just not just female, but you know, black founders, founders from ethnic minorities also receive shamefully little yeah. funding yeah. and in my experience it's the diverse founders who are actually tackling the real problems facing humanity today the problems that affect the 99 percent of people not the problems that to date have broadly received funding which are the problems that affect the one percent of people Absolutely. and so we're really shortchanging the world by not investing uh, properly in diverse founders and a big part of the problem in in my experience is the fact that the gatekeepers of capital do not have anywhere near enough diversity. Absolutely. And so if I look at our cap table, the vast majority of our investment has come from female investors. And the, the problem with that is there's only a handful of female investors mm. in, in London, let's say. Um, so there just aren't nearly enough diverse uh, investors out there. And that yeah. has to be change as a matter of priority and it's not just about bringing in a diverse associate or analyst it's we Agreed. need diverse partners people who have Absolutely. check writing ability and it's only when that happens that we'll see much more diverse businesses being founded that will not only solve the real problems in humanity but they will perform better every piece of evidence out there shows yeah. that diverse founders recruit diverse teams and diverse teams always outperform non-diverse teams so on every level, it it makes sense. Completely agree. We've actually got Czech Warner coming on the podcast from Diversity VC, and I can't wait to have that conversation with her. And, and we, you know, we've had Pippa Lam and uh, from Sweet Capital and Zoe Javier Hewitt from EQT on here, but frankly, there just isn't there isn't enough. And I know so many fantastic women who are really keen on the investing space that want to get into that world, and I think it would be brilliant. And it just feels criminal that uh, that there isn't a, a, a sort of more diverse uh, demographic so uh, yeah we will be championing that and uh, I think it's, it's a really important thing to uh, to talk about um well no thank thank you and uh, I I think um probably just the last thing on that point is there are probably going to be uh, sort of female entrepreneurs listening to this that are currently going through that cycle of pitching to investors so just from your experience are there any particular tips that you'd pass on to anyone that's in that process at, uh, at the moment I have a couple, yes. So I think the first one is to be aware of that data, to know the odds that you are facing and to allow yourself that moment of frustration, anger, grief, whatever it might be, and then quickly move into mitigation strategies. So one of them I would definitely recommend is for you to watch the TED Talk by Dana Kanzi. I think I'm pronouncing her name correctly, which is about prevention versus promotion strategies in fundraising. And essentially the research shows that female founders get asked prevention questions, which is all about minimizing the downside. What about the risk? What about the potential for loss? And the male founders are always asked promotion questions. How big can this grow? How fast mm. can you go? What if we gave you this? What about that? And as a female founder, I've been on the receiving end of just emails or a session, which is just prevention question after prevention question after prevention question. And the strategy for that, according to Dana, is to switch it around and answer a prevention question with a promotion uh, right. response. So definitely recommend that. The other thing I would recommend is if you're a diverse team or a female founded team is to establish your credentials as founders right at the beginning of your presentation deck. So we've, we've figured this out, I think, for our second raise, maybe our third one, that we needed to put our creds up front at the, as the very first slide in the deck. Because otherwise, people would see two female founders and all of their biases that came into that, perhaps that were yeah. not very commercial, perhaps were a bit too this or not enough that, 
would come into play. Whereas if you establish your credentials up front, then hopefully that just at least makes them take you seriously. Yeah. Frustrating that that has to happen, it seems. But yeah, fantastic advice, I think, for anyone listening. And I'm sure there'll be many uh, entrepreneurs uh, taking that on board and hopefully raising lots of capital as a result for their startups. I know um, funding often you know, goes towards, a lot of it goes towards building high performing teams. And I know yours is exactly that and has grown considerably over the last few years. Um, so a bit of a, a bias for me, given what I do, uh, but I'd love to just know how you've approached recruitment and, and also the lessons learned from hiring, because it is traditionally, it's it's easily for me, the hardest part of my job is actually recruiting for JBM. And I know our, our, our scale-up clients find it challenging. So uh, for any founders listening uh, that, that are struggling with that at the moment, would love to hear your, your thoughts and your experiences. I am very happy to share on that. And I guess our take on it is that and I do not want to sound in any way smug, but I want to reassure everybody that this is possible. So we have not struggled with recruitment. Um, and I think that's because of a couple of things. So the first is we have a super clear mission. The, it's a single sentence. It's written down. It's on our website. It, it's in everything we do. And when you have an incredibly strong mission, especially in this day and age, then you are naturally going to attract great quality talent. The second thing is we have a very clear set of values. Again, they're on our website. They're simple. There's four of them. We describe what they mean. Uh, and we always recruit against those values. And then another sort of tactical hack, I guess, is that just over a year ago, we put up a careers page on our website and we did an email data capture. So if you want to find out whenever Olio's next recruiting, leave your email address here. And we've already had over 1,500 people leave their email addresses there. So that meant that the last type recruitment round that we've just done was really, really fast. And we were overwhelmed with high caliber talent because we'd already kind of, I guess, built that pipeline ourselves ahead of time. And then the other thing that's linked to that that we've done throughout that I think a lot of businesses miss is a trick that they're missing is to recruit from your community. Mm. So half our team used to be Olio volunteers. They used to be yeah. regular Olio users. And so we always let our community know, we sort of yell from the rooftops whenever we're recruiting. And what that does is that just immediately brings us a pool of not just mission aligned, but mission obsessed people mm -hmm. and so we have always been spoiled for choice when recruiting and <laughs> more than once Sasha and I've been reduced to tears with joy with the <laughs> caliber of candidates we're confronting and, and the difficult choice we've had to make between deciding who to give the role to. Wow. That's wonderful to hear. That really is fantastic. And, uh, and, and I must say, I mean, we, 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 I think have a fantastic pool of candidates who are, are often most interested in mission driven businesses and, are, and are willing to compromise on things like, you know, taking a step back or, or, or a hit on salary, because really what they want to do is be making a difference in the world. And I think that's exactly what you're doing. And uh, I can see why you're attracting such brilliant people. It'd be remiss of me not to ask before we get to our final wrap up questions, uh, a bit about food waste and reducing it because that's obviously what Olio is all about so just do you have any final tips for our listeners about how we can do better and avoid wasting food uh, you know, whether it's in the family or individually I do so the first tip really is just a mindset shift so I think it's far too easy at the moment to see a couple of brown bananas toss them in the bin and think well what difference do I make now the reality is there's 28 million other households who this week are making that exact same mental maths. And as a result of that, we are throwing away millions of bananas every single day and millions of potatoes every single day and millions of tomatoes every single day. So it's really, really important that you recognize that what you do does count. Yeah. So given that, what can you do to reduce your food waste? The first thing, which sounds really boring, but I promise it's a lot more fun than it sounds, is to meal plan. It's just to kind of once a week, just say, right, what meals am I going to have this week? And yeah. to jot it down and then shop to the plan. The second thing um, would be to, you know, maybe spend anywhere between five minutes and half an hour just genning up on food storage hacks. So for example tomatoes should never be kept in the fridge and you can wrap a little piece of cloth or cling film or something over the top of bananas and it will dramatically extend their shelf life 
onions and potatoes should never be stored together. Um, so there's just loads and loads and loads of these sort of food storage um, tips and tricks that will make a massive difference. The third thing then I'd say is just learn to love your leftovers and be prepared to experiment and just get a little bit creative in the kitchen. Almost without exception, our best meals have just been these random medleys of yeah. leftovers that we somehow sort of pulled together and, and somehow it always tastes better. So, yeah. you know, when something's sort of a day or two older. And then the final thing is it is inevitable living the lives that we live that you will always find yourself with more food than you need. And, and that's a good thing, right? We don't want to be having less food than we need. And so if you do find yourself in a situation where you've got more food than you need, then please, please, please consider um, adding it to the Olio app and giving it to a neighbor. You might think who on earth is going to want two lemons? Who on earth is going to want just a head of broccoli? And the answer is there's absolutely no shortage of people who want to yeah. get out of the house, pop across the road and pick something up. And actually half of all the listings added to the app are requested within 30 minutes. Wow. So our biggest ask is just getting people to share their spare. I'm sure lots of people will take that on board and hopefully get get sharing and uh, and think of all the amazing banana bread that you can make with all those spare bananas. It's the <laughs> amazing. Well, thank you so much, Tessa. It's been a it's been a real joy to chat. I I wanted to just wrap up with our final three questions. This is the forty minute mentor, so I've got to ask about mentorship. And um, do you have a mentor? And if so, how have they helped you on your career journey? So I don't have a mentor, and I think that's probably because. I just try and learn as much as I can from absolutely everybody I ever talk to. But if I was forced to pick someone who might have played a mentoring role in my life, I would pick a lady called Natasha Christie Miller. And we were peers, actually, when we worked at EMAP. And I think we sort of mentored each other. Mm. So I came into my role with a very strong um, strategy background. She came into her role with a very strong sort of people and sales background. And we sort of co-mentored each other, we peer mentored each other. And a couple of years later, I think we both came out of that, that process a lot stronger and a lot more well-rounded as leaders. So I don't think a mentor always has to be someone who is senior to you or more advanced than you. No, I completely agree. I think it does come in multiple forms. You can have formal mentors, you can have informal ones. And I agree. I think peers and 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 family. I mean, my uncle was a huge mentor to me in the early years of JBM. I think it it really does come in different shapes and sizes. So th thank you for that. And I, I'd love to know what the plan is for Olio over the next 12 months. I know we, you've uh, we've all been tackling this global pandemic, which hasn't been easy, but uh, looking at a positive sp spin on things, what does the the next 12 months have in store? So we are really, really focused on making sure that we're in great shape for our next fundraising round, which is our Series B, which will be kicking off in January 2022. So everything works backward from that. But it kind of falls into a couple of categories. First of all, we've got some really exciting product development initiatives that are underway. So we recently launched a goals section of the app, which is helping people. It's a bit like sort of Tinder for sustainability. We've also launched a section called Made, which connects neighbors to sell homemade food and handmade crafts with each other. And coming up in the new year, we'll be launching a new section called Borrow, which connects neighbors to lend household items to one another. So we've got a lot of work to do around product. We're then also rolling Olio out across all of Tesco's store portfolio across the whole country so that their stores can all be zero food waste. So that is keeping us extremely occupied. And then the third thing is around monetization. So we are going to be starting to implement a freemium model next year. So essentially a bunch of... Uh, subscription features. Great. Wonderful. Fantastic. Well, we wish you all the very best for that. I'm excited to see uh, where the business goes. I think lots of exciting things in store. And I, and I guess the final question for me, Tessa, is just around anyone that's listening to this, that's kind of got that entrepreneurial bug in there somewhere and is thinking about starting up their own company. What one final piece of advice would you leave them with? I would give them a couple of reading tips, if that's okay. So the first one would be to read The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. It's an absolute Bible for how to get something sort of from an idea into market and quickly iterate it. The second would be another book, which is called The Mom Test by Rob Fitzpatrick, which is about how to do customer research in a way that's going to be really honest with yourself in the early days. Then the third thing I'd say would be to listen obsessively to podcasts. That's how Sasha and I learned absolutely everything that we've learned today about entrepreneurship. 
And if you're interested, you can follow me on Medium. And I've got a blog post, which is called something like, how do you want to build a billion dollar app? And in that I've shared about our sort of top 20 or 25 podcasts that Sasha and I have listened to and have learned along the way. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Tessa. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Very excited about the years ahead. And um, yeah, we, we're looking forward to hopefully at some point meeting in person. Um, <laughs> but thank you again for being such a great 40 Minute Mentor. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Thank you so much for tuning back in. I really hope you enjoyed today's 40 Minute Mental episode. And if you're after even more mentorship, then please make sure you look through our podcast archives of over 200 episodes. And if you're enjoying 40 Minute Mentor, we would love to hear why. We read every single review that you leave us. So please consider taking one minute today to head over to ratethispodcast.com forward slash 40mm or your favorite podcast platform to let us know what you're enjoying about the pod. And if you have any feedback on how we can make it even better, please reach out to our head of marketing and 40 Minute Mentor producer, Hannah, on hannah at jbmc.co.uk. We really can't wait to hear from you.